All right, so welcome back everybody. Um, we are back here with Tyler Key from Concept Controls. Um, on this segment, we are gonna focus on respiratory protection. Welcome back, Tyler. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So I wanna start off talking about why respiratory protection is important, right? What situations would require a worker to wear respiratory protection? Respiratory protection is absolutely critical. If you're in an IDLH or immediate uh, danger situation, you absolutely need respiratory protection. But what a lot of people might not think about is there's a lot of nuisance that contributes to occupational diseases as well. So you might be doing something that you consider rather, let's call it non-invasive or mundane, but at the end of the day, repeated exposure can create some serious challenges. So. Absolutely. Yeah, respiratory protection, absolutely. Um, what I would recommend to those watching, uh, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, Alberta OHS has put out an excellent bulletin on the subject matter. It's PPE001. They call it breathing apparatus, but of course it covers more than breathing apparatus. So if you're in an IDLH environment or you're in a nuisance area that can contribute to an occupational disease, you need to be wearing um, respiratory protection. So toxic contaminants can be an issue. Oxygen deficiency can be an issue. Being exposed to particulate gas, vapors, biological agents, there's all kinds of things that we can come in contact with. And one thing I wanted to mention about respiratory protection, this is becoming more and more prevalent in the conversations that we're having with our manufacturer partner. I know that CSA has started to build this into their uh, standards as well. We need to make sure that people are comfortable in their respiratory protection. So there is an element of, can I wear this thing for eight hours? Right. You need to consider that, right? Absolutely. Well, I know when you were talking about um, the different types of exposures, particulates, I know that's been, silica exposure has been a huge one for us over the past, I would say two, three years. I know that it was a kind of a focus area for uh, OHS over the last little while. And, you know, I don't think many people kind of maybe outside of the industrial world realize the hazard that comes with those light particulates, right? Breathing in that silica dust, that sand, getting into your lungs, right? Creating silicosis and other, you know, health concerns that are, can be fatal. <laughs> well, you're looking at silicosis, mesothelioma. I mean, all those things, they add up over time, right? It's not, you're not going to keel over and, and choke and die instantly, but you certainly don't want that in your lungs long term. Absolutely. Well, and like we talked about when we were talking about noise and noise management on our last segment, um, you know, silica exposure testing and things like that are always reactive, right? And are somewhat preventable. Put on the appropriate PPE, put in the you know proper controls, and we can get to a place where we're not seeing those types of issues develop in the first place. Oh, exactly. And I, I think the biggest challenge is some people might be lost as to how we measure silica. I mean, it's it's not an easy thing. It's not like you just go to a, a standard distributor and say, hey, I want to measure silica today. And, and you know, uh, when it comes down to it, there are some specialized instruments that can help you measure silica. I know that uh, there's quite a few that we work with from TSI that will measure, they'll give you real time measurements of silica. So it's one thing to have, uh, let's call it uh, a snapshot. So you're doing an air, air sample, you're sending it off to a lab. That's great from a regulatory perspective. And you certainly want to do that to be compliant. But by the same token, what are we getting exposed to real time? So just bear in mind that there are tools, there's instrumentation out there that can assist. Awesome. So let's talk PPE. So what type of respiratory protection is available? And maybe what are some of the pros and cons of each of those different types? So when it comes to PPE, we're all... Wonderfully akin to the N95, courtesy of this, uh, this pandemic that we've gone through. So I think most lay people will understand what a P95 or an N95 is, or you know, something that has a, a reduced, uh, let's call it efficacy, efficacy in comparison to a P100 or something that is 99.997% uh, effective at filtering, right? So those N95s, it's your most basic level of protection. The challenge that I find with N95s is a lot of people don't necessarily know how to test mm. or bother testing because they figure, eh, it's a paper mask good enough, right? right? So I think we need to focus on that and we need to focus on the testing. So it's not necessarily 
the easiest thing to test for because, you know, the way that they're designed and, and certainly the can 95s that we've seen come into the country, um, they just don't perform the same way. And so fit testing is absolutely critical. So as far as I'm concerned, N95s, they have a purpose, but in the industrial world, they should be limited. We really should be looking at half masks, full masks where required supplied air, right. uh, eight packs, and SCBAs, right? Those okay. are all absolutely critical, great devices. So you might find an N95 is lightweight. It's a great short run tool, right? But you're going to be plowing through many of those throughout the workday if you're using them as your primary mask. So we kind of uh, recommend that people look at the half mask as being, you know, the basic to start off with. And you can get them in different styles, sizes, varieties, even the, the material. So some people will run with a, like a rubber high car, which is your basic half mask, whereas a, a silica half mask is much more comfortable for prolonged use and better when it comes to it, right? Okay. Nice. And I know, you know, when obviously throughout the pandemic, you know, we got very involved with N95 masks, um, especially, you know, with that initial first wave and then people going back to work. We were doing a lot of fit testing for people we've never really dealt with before. People in, you know, typically non-safety sensitive industries like physicians and dentists and nurses and things like that. Yep. And I know that supply was low. So how is supply sitting these days for N95s? Are people able to purchase those again? Or where are we at with that? We're coming back. Uh, I do know that 3M has a, a facility that they're running now in Ontario, which is great. So they're, they're providing some Canadian-made masks. There are some other manufacturers out there. We've certainly partnered with a, a company called the Clips Masks that are producing them in Canada. Okay. Um, so that particular style is not an I should approved at this point. There's a lot of masks that have received Health Canada temporary approvals or, or initial approvals just okay. because we, we needed masks in a hurry, right? Absolutely. So one thing I will recommend to anyone who's purchasing these masks, buyer beware, make sure that when you're purchasing the mask, you're, you're cautious, you're fit testing your, your team members. And when it comes to the pros and cons of these masks, an N95 just doesn't protect the same way that a, that a full face mask will. Of course, it's not as cumbersome. I mean, we're when we're in a hot environment, uh, of course, the day a full face mask isn't fun. But by the same token, it can be necessary depending upon the protection factor. All right. 